The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3Advance, developers of sports tech apps that are AI-powered and UX-focused. So if you're looking to create some apps for your startup or your sports biz calls for some artificial or business intelligence, you should check out 3Advance. They're incredible. Go to 3Advance.com. That's the number 3Advance.com. Empire. Is there anything virtual about fighting? You know, we're, we're very in, it, in the early stages of considering this type of thing, but looking at you know pattern recognition of your opponent, um, looking at how they would set their body up with, to throw particular strikes, um, and, and you can potentially use that um, again for pattern recognition, for depth perception. That's Dr. Duncan French, the Vice President of Performance at the UFC Performance Institute, where the best fighters in the world are modernizing at their pace. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. Times have changed in the octagon, and Duncan French is here to tell us what from the tech space is helping fighters become more prolific and what tech hasn't quite caught up to them yet. Plus, a visit with Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, who is on the UFC card next month in New York. You're going to hear a lot about recovery from all of them from injury, which is educational, of course. But there are some gaps in what tech and science can do for certain trauma. Let's fix this concussion problem. Change the rules, obviously. Have less hitting in practice, fine or suspend players who recklessly aim for the head. Those are really easy solutions. Others portend to have other answers, like better helmets, mouthpieces, other protective gear. But there's a problem with those new technologies that they may not even have a chance to work. Christy Ashwand had wrote a piece for Wired on this and joins us now. Hi, Christy. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. What did you find out? So what I found out is that all of these technologies that are being developed um, to try and address concussions from sort of a biomechanical uh, point of view, you know, helmets and and mouth guards and things like this, they all sort of face this fundamental almost law of physics problem. And that is, you know, concussions are really related to when the head is undergoing either a very sudden acceleration or deceleration. So basically when it's it's juggled really quickly or stop comes to a really short stop. Um, and so I think you can kind of think of this, the analogy that, that makes a lot of sense to me is imagine that um, your brain is a passenger in a car and the car is sort of the skull. And so what happens is, you know, if the, the car comes to a, a sudden stop, um, the, the passenger is slammed against against the dashboard there. Uh, or conversely, you know, if it accelerates really fast, you're sort of pushed back. Um, you know, with, when we're talking about people in cars, we have seat belts and things that we can do, but there's no way to put a seat belt around the brain. And so you have these this movement within the brain um, that the, the brain's undergoing when you, when you have these sudden movements. And there's really no getting away from the fact that this is going to happen if you have these kinds of motions. And so, you know, you can do things, most most things like helmets, what they do is they try to extend the force and sort of absorb some of them, but you're just not going to be able to um, overcome this fundamental problem, which is that, you know, the brain is, is moving around inside the skull and it's that movement and that, that sudden motion that seems to be doing the damage and concussion. Here's the problem though, like the NFL can't slap a warning label on a helmet like cigarettes did with their product that say, I understand you're going to do this, but you have to understand what you're getting yourself into. So I'm not sure what the answer is for them by, by what you're telling us today. Well, I mean, you know, if we lived in a different society, yeah. the answer would be to stop doing, you know, stop intentionally slamming guys around, you know, slamming your head, you know, and doing things to avoid, you know, the, the solution here is going to be reducing hits to the head. Now, however you want to do that, um, you know, if, if we're going to insist on still playing games that involved a, a lot of head hitting, you know, we're, I think we're going to have to accept that there's going to be some injuries that happen. Um, you know, imagine that this was some other body part, you know, knees, you know, I'm a skier and skiers are known, you know, we talk at summer parties, you can see who the skiers are by who has the scars on their knees from knee surgery. And, you know, you can say that we're going to accept this, that this is a risk and that's okay or, or not. 
Um, but, but I don't think there's getting around this fundamental fact that when you have these these hits to the head, there's going to be you know the risk of, of injury, and I don't think that you can get around that and still hit your head. Um, is, have you seen anything in terms of the advancement with the technology, though, that is helping at least limit some of the damage that is occurring? Look, there's a lot of promises that are being made. Most of them don't pan out. Um, you know, there are probably things that are making differences, but they're small differences. And I think the danger here is that a lot of these things may give people a false sense of security. I mean, we're sort of at peak concussion awareness right now, and so everyone feels this very intense need to do something, and rightly so. But there's a lot of pressure on, say, coaches and schools, and you know, forget even at the NFL level, but there's a lot of kids you know, a lot of high school kids and younger who are playing football. And, you know, there's a real sense that decision makers there and the people that are sort of in charge of keeping kids safe need to do something and need to show that they're addressing the problem. And I think what a lot of these products do is they give people an opportunity to say, hey, look, we're throwing resources at this. We're taking this seriously um, without necessarily making a big dent in, in the potential for injury. It seems like an unsolvable problem, but I think sports at least has to try to make advances, right? I mean, they have no choice here but to, if nothing else, speak to the public that they are trying to do something about this. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, the NFL has made some changes. There have been some changes to football. You know, they've outlawed head-to-head hits. You know, that's a good start. It's not going to entirely solve the problem. The thing is, you have to uh, hit the head directly in order to have a concussion. It's really these sudden changes in direction and and it seems as though twisting and and that sort of motion is even worse than a direct hit you know sort of uh front front to back and so you know anything that produces those kinds of forces i mean it can be a player just falling on the ground it can be someone hitting someone else on the shoulder it doesn't have to be head-to-head contact and you know it can happen even without direct contact to the head it can be the body being jerked around which then you know because the head is attached to the body the head gets jerked around and you know you get this brain moving around and and slamming inside the the skull maybe on second thought they just need the warning label christy ashwad yeah. from wired thank you so much pleasure to be here coming up Dr. Duncan French from the UFC Performance Institute on how the modern fighter uses old technique and innovation to rule the octagon. This is the Future Sport Podcast. Our guest this week is the Vice President of Performance at the UFC Performance Institute in Las Vegas, Nevada, Dr. Duncan French. Hey, Duncan, how are you? Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Bram, nice to hear from you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. So uh, what do you do at the UFC Performance Institute? Um, It's a great question. I mean, in in my role as the Vice President of Performance, I essentially... Uh, direct and lead the, the strategy and the interface between the uh, performance staff here at the Institute um, and the athlete roster of which we have uh, just around 600 fighters globally. Um, so my job is to kind of coordinate and manage the staff and create our performance strategies about how we will interface and interact with the fighters to deliver the best care and the best services possible. So can you give us that in layman's terms a little bit? What, what, what does that mean day to day when you're working with the athletes themselves? Yeah, everything from, so here at the Performance Institute, you know, we have expertise in strength and conditioning, nutrition and dietetics, um, physical therapy and sports medicine, uh, and sports science and technology. Um, And, you know, on a day-to-day basis, we're we're working with fighters, trying to address their specific needs, targets, and goals, um, and then obviously shaping our performance services to to manage and meet their expectations. So athletes come into to the facility with very different expectations and requirements. Some are coming with uh, weight management and, uh, and, and and body composition issues where they're trying to make a, a particular weight class for our sport. So we'll work with them on, on helping to shape uh, dietary interventions and strategy around metabolism and managing their body composition. Other athletes might come in for, for rehabilitation and um you know, post-fight injury and managing, um, you know, return to competition and return to play strategies. So it's very customized. It's very bespoke. Um, and on a day-to-day basis, we, we uh, the cross we bear is that we, we build our programming around each individual athlete that walks through the doors and we try and optimize the, the, uh, the interaction that we have with them. 
Is this new interactions with them? Has the sport always been this forward thinking about performance? I mean, the sport of mixed martial arts is only 25 years old professionally, and that's one of the most exciting things about what we're doing here at the Performance Institute. If you look at other sports like soccer or American football or baseball, you know, some of those have been around since the 1800s, 1950s. You know, the UFC as a sport is very, uh, very young and in its infancy. Um, so we, we, we're on a, a pathway here. Um, I always... I always say that we, we have three responsibilities our our number number one responsibility is to deliver services to our fighter our roster of fighters either in person here in las vegas in our facility in shanghai or remotely and um, wherever they may be in the world the second responsibility we have is to aggregate data and do research and find new innovations around the sport of mixed martial arts because again the the insights and the research out there in the literature is, is pretty pretty small in its infancy right now and then the third piece is obviously to disseminate that information, to share it with a global fight community um, so that we can elevate and raise best practices throughout the globe. Um, so, you know, this is this is hand-to-hand combat. A number of these techniques obviously have been perfected through the years through a number of different disciplines. Um, how does technology fit into the mode of making a fighter better? Yeah, it's a huge part of what we do here. And again, what we, we embrace technology and data and, and data insights to, to influence decision making. That, that's at the core and the mantra of, of what we do as our philosophy at the Performance Institute. I think when you look at um, the sport of mixed martial arts, things and perhaps the biggest challenges uh, for our sport compared to some other sports that wear uniforms and pads or you know wearable technology is our fighters are going into the octagon basically with some spandex shorts and a you know, sports bra on potentially so the opportunity to use technology to really um, define competition is is a challenge to us um, and in the philosophy of sharing competition to then align all of your services and your strategies to targeting specific aspects of competition I think that's certainly one of the most challenging aspects that we're presented with. But the other side of that coin is that we've got a sport that is, um, you know, it's mixed martial arts. So it's truly the decathlon of combat sports. It brings lots of different stylistic backgrounds into competition. Um, and being able to use things, you know, different types of technology to monitor and manage workloads, to gain an insight into the physiological demands of training, um, and, and how athletes are pushing their body and how their body is responding to that training um, is crucial conversation builder around how we optimize performance at the right time to make sure athletes are not overtraining or, or that they are you know, suboptimal responses to the training intervention. So technology is, is everywhere in, in, in what we do around training competition. And obviously in the medical space, um, as we explore more and more kind of insights into how uh, you know, how we heal, how we you know look at tissue healing, how we expedite return to play using different modalities and interventions, all driven by technology, many of which also allow us to capture data to you know take away the guesswork and, and understand regression and progression. Um, I, I always say if you're not assessing, you're guessing, and so data is a, is a huge part to formulating our thoughts and, and being strategic in the way we work with things. Um, so, you know, in the, the caveat to that in the sport of MMA right now, the Performance Institute is leading the way in terms of embracing technology to essentially evolve the sport um, and take it to new standards. Um, have you found that the athletes have changed their mentality about how they train for this than in years past? Well, I think that's a key, that's a really key comment. I mean, ultimately, um, fighting is probably the first sport ever you know back in you know back in the days in neanderthals that people were fighting and it was competitive um and i think that's the the great thing about the sport of mma is it's the purest form of combat um and people can comprehend it very easily um we don't want to remove that people have been understanding how to train and compete for fight sports for thousands of years and um, what we're trying to do is use modern day technology to influence and shape and make better decisions around some of those strategies so i always use the analogy of a you know a, a stallion we you know we don't want to take the wild out of the stallion and um, we need fighters who uh, you know have fight the heart and fight the spirit um, but we can train a stallion we can <laughs> shape it and, and and train it to do particular things and what we're trying to 
take that philosophy and that analogy into the Performance Institute here and work with, you know, the world's best fighters to uh, tough, hard people and embrace fight, fighting and combat. Um, but we're wrapping it with modern day technology and, and new insights around training strategy and training theory so that, again, we can continue to make the next evolve, evolution of the sport. I think uh, that's, that's our philosophy and how we look at it. You had mentioned wearables. Is there a place for that in training and, and what can be learned from fighters using them in training? Yeah, I mean, definitely. There's, there's a space for wearables. I think, you know, looking at accelerometers and gyroscopes and, and you know, instrumented uh, gloves, you know, we can and, and equipment. We can look at different um, instrumented mouth guards. So, you know, that we can place technology in many different places around the body in a training environment because we're using different protective equipment, either be it head guards, be it mouth guards. Um, obviously, in the gloves, we can look at punch velocities and punch types and impact forces and those types of things um so in the in the training space yeah we, we, we're absolutely embracing those types of things to comprehend the work demands the intrinsic and extrinsic work demands of, of competition as i've already kind of touched on i think the challenge becomes competition itself where you know the ability to use wearable technology or, or how the current um landscape of wearable technology currently sits um, if you think about things like GPS and accelerometers or heart rate monitors, a lot of those um, would would present a real challenge in competition um, because our guys wear, wear no clothing. Um, we really need kind of skin-mounted um, technology that's not going to move, that's not going to be able to be pulled or yanked by an opponent and grabbed by an opponent, which can then obviously create noise in the data signal. Um, so, yeah, we, we're really trying to look at the next evolution of, let's call it, um, invis invisibles rather than wearables because I think that's going to be more conducive to data insight and data capture for our our sport in particular, which is different perhaps to, say, rugby um, or soccer or American football um, where those guys can play place GPS units between their shoulder blades. They can wear a heart, heart rate strap and heart rate belt across their chest. Um, our guys can't do that in competition, and that's a real hole in our capabilities right now. But um, certainly in, in a training environment, yeah, we're, we're trying to capture information and then obviously extrapolate to competition um, some of those insights. And how about video capture? A lot of sports are using a lot of different angles. They're capturing a lot of different um, uh, ways to, to, um, to review either performance in actual fights or uh, in training as well. Is video technology changing how the fighters train now? Yeah, I mean, video technology is, is certainly something that the UFC is looking at and um, being able to, you know, monitor some of those, um, you know, striking velocities and striking characteristics using video technology rather than wearable technology. And that's how we're trying to solve, you know, some of those problems. Um, but in the training domain as well, um, if you think about, um, you know, the... The, the, the ability to see many different body positions and different angles in grappling and wrestling exchanges, that, that's really crucial. So, you know, I think that other sports like football and basketball will do hours and hours of film study. Um, I think it's quite a new thing uh, that's coming into combat sports, looking at breaking down opponent styles and, and, and looking at your own techniques and how you can essentially strategically win a fight. Uh, more and more of the gyms around the world are starting to really embrace video technology for, for strategy, um, which is an awesome thing. And then obviously, you know, the next frontier is, is you know, VR and those types of things um, and how we can potentially use something like VR um, without the fighters receiving, you know, blows and impacts to the head or the body, um, allowing them still to train different skill sets and different reactions and perceptions um, without the, the, you know, without the impact and the, and the need to, to um, you know, to, to take different different shots uh, within the, the combat domain. So we're looking at all of these different types of video um, capabilities and virtual reality capabilities to see how we can fit them into our sport. In virtual, um, because this is a, a, a solo sport, um, do you think that virtual reality can actually replicate what it would be like for the fighter to train? I don't right now in terms of where the technology is at right now. Um, but I think, you know, if I use the, you know, use the analogy of a quarterback, you know, in football, 
Um, a lot of brain training or training above the neck, you know, looking at pattern recognition without a defensive lineman kind of throwing himself on top of you is going to be, you know, it's going to have some amount of transference. It's going to increase cognitive processing skills. Um, and, and you're also removing the, the risk of the, of the impacts, you know. So it, it's a it's training above the neck in a safe environment without the, the physiological or the physical impacts and the physical uh, demands of it. So if we use that analogy and put it into fighting, um, you know, we, we're very in the early stages of considering this type of thing, but looking at, you know, pattern recognition of your opponent, um, looking at how they would set their body up with, to throw particular strikes, um, and, and you can potentially use that, um, again, for pattern recognition, for depth perception, for peripheral vision, to try and understand how you can use VR for training, um, you know, different techniques and responses to different movement patterns um, without taking any punishment. So I think that's where potentially it would sit in our space. Um, like I say, it's still very much in its infancy, and we're trying to figure out how it might work for us. Um, but as I look into the crystal ball, of technology and sports science and try and apply it to um, MMA. You know, that, that's kind of things that we're, we're considering. Um, all right, I'll let you go with this. Um, you had mentioned that, that you guys are obviously looking at recovery, um, which would be a big part of getting the fighters back and available to perform in their next fight. Um, have, have you learned anything about um, tissue recovery or other types of recovery that is transferable to people outside of this realm in the general medical field? Um, that, that's a really good question, and again, it probably sits outside some of our capabilities, let's say, internally, to, to really get into biological and biochemistry analytics and deep research and basic science around recovery. I think what we can do is provide some very um, applied examples in, in real-life situations with guys that experience trauma um, and different mechanisms of, of wound and, and, and you know, blunt force trauma and damage and, and fracture um, to then understand anecdotally um, what are we doing in, in the applied space. So a little bit of you know, practice-based evidence rather than evidence-based practice. And I think there's, a, there's an approach for both of those two scenarios, you know. Um, I think what I would say in response to your question is that we're getting a lot of collaboration um, and interest from other um, external groups, particularly in the military, in the special forces, in tactical units um, that you can obviously imagine that have got very similar kind of combative demands as, as fighters and probably experience some of the, the similar injuries. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of create little think tanks and, and brain centers for, for those people that have got similar approaches to ourselves in the military um, and tactical operations in particular. But again, we get a lot of collaboration and interest from, from other sports leagues around the world that either experience, you know, concussion and, and, and brain injury um, and, and obviously lacerations, fractures and those types of things. And I think it's, it, it's, it's one of those things that we probably don't have the capabilities to take it on in its entirety on our, on our, alone, on our own. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, collaboration and, and sharing of insights is going to push us to new, new, new understanding for sure. Dr. Duncan French is the Vice President of Performance at the UFC Performance Institute. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. French. No problem. Appreciate the time. Have a great day. Dr. French is going to be speaking at the Interrupt MedTech Summit in Los Angeles on October 17th at Scale LA. Healthcare is all-encompassing from the medical professional to the patient, and their summit will cover a variety of experiences in building medical technology to not only impact the healthcare industry, but the lives depending on it. Up next, fighter Stephen Wonderboy Thompson on how tech has helped him stay in his prime. This is the Future Sport Podcast. So let's take a minute here to thank our friends at 3 Advance. These guys are ranked one of the nation's top app developers, but that's not all. They've helped grow a bunch of sports tech startups like Team Builder, T-Box Tour, and In-Game Fantasy. But they're also experts in user experience, cloud APIs, and artificial intelligence. So if you're looking for a dev partner to bring your future sport tech to life, look these guys up. 
Go to 3advance.com. They're the team to make it happen. At Advance, you will. That's the number 3advance.com. And tell them Future Sport sent you. So the modern fighter has changed, and one of the best in the business is hoping his holistic and AI-powered approach can help you become your best, too. Steven Wonderboy Thompson, at 36, appears more dangerous in an octagon now than he did when he was younger and supposedly in his prime, and he joins us now as he is preparing to fight at UFC 244 in New York City in early November. Thanks for being here, Steven. Oh, man, thanks for having me, my friend. I really appreciate it. Uh, before we get into your specific partnership, um, how would you say you train differently now than when you did when you were a young fighter? Well, you know, um, definitely now we're a little bit more, a little bit smarter than I was then. I mean, um, we I spar twice a week, uh, and I pad up from head to toe. I wear 18 ounce gloves, headgear. Um, you know, in those younger days, that testosterone starts flowing pretty good, and you want to start banging it out. Which, you know, as you get older, you gotta really take care of, um, you know, your head. You can't condition the brain, so you gotta use more control to the bot or to the head. You can kind of work the body a little bit, but just keep being more cautious with the sparring. And I kind of keep a, a small circle of uh, good training partners around me, guys who, you know, are very careful with you and, you know, um, you know, especially when it comes to the wrestling and the jiu-jitsu, making sure their, they're, they're, you know, they're, their takedowns are good and, good and controlled and uh, just being more careful that way, to be honest with you. But another thing, getting more sleep and, you know, just keeping that diet, uh, diet right. You know, you're, I'm a professional athlete, and you got to put that, you know, that race fuel in your system before you step out there and, and get a workout in or compete. Are you doing wearables now, or are you, are you learning about your own biometrics as you prepare day-to-day to get into the octagon? You know, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's there's a lot of things that I've been doing lately, uh, especially, you know, you know, physically, mentally, to be honest with you. Um Making sure my mind right is right before I step out in the octagon. Um, there's a lot of guys, especially after my last fight, um, I ended up getting knocked out, which is something you never want. Um, but just making sure everything up up top is okay before I step out there. Um, you know, keeping positive people around me definitely helps out. Good coaches, good training partners. But to be honest with you, my body feels great. And what about video technology? Do do you guys utilize any of that to try to scout your opponents differently than than maybe you had in the past? Oh, 100%. I mean, now you can literally go on uh, your cell phone and, and, you know, watch, do some fight study. And that's huge in, in this sport. You know, whenever I have an opponent, I always go back from their first fight all the way up to the most recent fight to see if they've made any changes. You know, the guys out there who evolve after every fight, those are the ones you got to watch out for because you don't know what they're going to be working on this time. But there are guys uh, such as Johnny Hendricks, who I fought, have faced before. You've seen him fight once. You've seen them fight a hundred times. So fight video, uh, watching um, that on your cell phone, um, on the iPad is very important for us. So making sure that you know you're studying your opponent is important. But even even yourself, uh, for our sparring session today, we just got done. We were we videoed the whole sparring session. That way we can kind of go back and see, you know, if we've made any mistakes out there. Okay, um, he took me down here. How can I prevent that next time? So all that is very important. Um, I'll leave you with this. Why UFC? Why did you want to be a fighter? You know what? That is a very good question. It's kind of, it is kind of weird to have maybe somebody who's sitting behind the desk for 10 years all of a sudden say, hey, you know what? I want to become a professional fighter and actually go do it. I've, been, I've grown up in the martial arts. I've started, the, I've started karate at the age of three years old. My dad fought back in the 70s and 80s. My sister, my little sister, fought before me. She kicked my butt for years. <laughs> Uh, but they were my inspiration to actually start competing. We have a family gym back home. Who's been, we've been open for 36 years. We have three generations of martial artists come through. we got grandkids of grandparents that took from us, which is pretty cool. But, um, yeah, man, that's how I actually got started. They, they were my inspiration. I actually started competing pro, uh, co- in full-contact sports at the age of 15 and turned pro in 2005. I was 57-0 and in kickboxing, undefeated. And I ended up tearing every ligament in my left leg. I was oh. out for three years. Oh. Doctor told me I would probably never fight again. And, um, you know, me being a, a competitive person and being in the martial arts, you know, basically my entire life, I wasn't going to let that happen. So 
I remember after surgery, um, sitting in a chair, hitting the bag the next day. So I knew it wasn't going to slow me down. And then next thing you know, in 2012, UFC called, and I'm just along for the ride, my friend. <laughs> uh, man, you must have an incredible Thanksgiving with that with that family background. Holy mackerel, <laughs> those people in the same room. Yeah, growing up. <laughs> oh yeah, growing up it was it, we were a handful for sure. There yeah. were five of us. I got two brothers. Started at three. Now I've got eleven nieces and nephews. Um, Chris Weidman, the former middleweight champion, is my brother-in-law now. So huh. hey, man, the family keeps growing. A uh, family of fighters for sure. That's right. Stephen Wonderboy Thompson is going to meet Vicente Luque at Madison Square Garden. It's part of USC 244, and it's on November second. Thanks for joining us, Stephen. Anytime, my friend. Hopefully, we can do it again. I appreciate it. That will do it for us this week. Remember, the future is now. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3Advance, developers of sports tech apps that are AI-powered and UX-focused. So if you're looking to create some apps for your startup or your sports biz calls for some artificial or business intelligence, you should check out 3Advance. They're incredible. Go to 3Advance.com. That's the number 3Advance.com.